Okay. So let's just quickly finish up chapter 13 and talk about memory, which is perfect because a lot of this will address uh, you folks, especially as you move through this chapter when you're trying to, um, or for the rest of the course, and trying to learn some information. So let's talk about memory. There's three types of memory. There's sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. All right. So ideally, you know, where we ultimately want to be is uh, we want long-term memory, especially when we're discussing, you know, like for this class, when you're trying to study for this class, you want to be able to recall that information. So memory is a progressive type of phenomenon in which we are going to start off with sensory memory, and then we'll transition to short-term memory, and then eventually into long-term memory. So let's talk a little bit about what each is here. All right, for example, sensory memory obviously is in uh, regards to sensory input, and that can come from any type of sensory input. It can be visual, it can be auditory. The example here is the smell of coffee, that's all faction. Right, so that memory, when we're discussing sensory memory, uh, time-wise only lasts for a few seconds. When we, <laughs> excuse me, when we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> <clears throat> when we talk about short-term memory, this will last a little bit longer, seconds to hours. All right, but now we're going to deal with something that is going to require what we call about seven bits of information. <clears throat> and that's why there's um, some teaching techniques out there in which some teachers are trying to present bits of information in seven increments. So for example, if I were to say to you, okay, I want you to make flashcards for all of the lab identification uh, uh, landmarks and structures for the brain. And every day, I want you to take seven cards and go over those seven cards until you know them. So you'll go over those, those, those seven cards. You might look at them for about five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever. And then I'll say, okay, put those down, then come back to them, all right, that night. So you did it in the morning. I said, all right, come back to them at night and see if you know all seven flashcards. If you do, great, all right? Now you can pick up another seven new cards and start that uh, uh, practice. So that is based on a limited capacity because you're only going to uh, uh, utilize seven bits of information, seven landmarks or, or seven concepts. Right? For whatever reason, seven seems to be that number that uh, works best when we're trying to establish short-term memory. Now, where long-term memory comes into play is when we can get something into short-term memory, we have successfully moved it into long-term memory. We call that process encoding. So when we need to go and retrieve that information, all right, it's stored in long-term memory. In order to encode something, we increase our chances of encoding by repeating whatever it is over and over and over again. And I'll show you a great picture here. So if we successfully encode it, it moves into long-term memory. If not, then it's lost and um, we'll have to start the whole process over again. If it's in long-term memory, it could be there forever. Right, there is a saying out there, if you, if you use it, uh, um, if you don't use it, you lose it, okay, which is true. If you put it into long-term memory and never access it, there's a chance that it could, uh, it could leave. So this picture here is great when we're talking about processing all that information. So first off, we start off with some sort of stimulus, okay, something that we taste, something that we uh, um, see, something that we hear, all right? So right now, you folks that are listening to me are hearing me. And so we're stimulating all right, that sensory information, that sensory memory. And when you're looking at the screen, you're seeing these images up here again. 
So we start off by utilizing those sensory organs and it puts that first bit of information into our sensory memory. And it only will last for a few seconds. So if you're not really paying attention, most likely you'll wind up forgetting it. <clears throat> if you are actually paying attention, then you'll move it into the short-term memory. Now, this can last for hours, okay, possibly days, all right? And, <clears throat> well, not days, excuse me, um, minutes to hours. So this is that example I was talking about by going over those flashcards. You can consistently go over those flashcards. The more you repeat that, right, the more likely you ensure that that short-term memory information undergoes what we call encoding, and then it will enter into long-term memory, which it can remain there indefinitely. So from time to time, when you have to retrieve it, like someone's name or a recipe or some sort of uh, uh, sports statistic fact, right? So when you go to retrieve it, you'll bring it back into your short-term memory and then you can mention that, whatever it is that you're talking about. But if you do not undergo encoding, right? Then you will wind up forgetting whatever it was that you were looking at. If you don't retrieve it from time to time, you can also undergo forgetting that bit of information. So keep in mind how that process works. So <clears throat> you'll notice here, next to the definition of encoding, you'll see memory consolidation. Huh. Where did we see that before? Consolidation, memory consolidation. Oh yeah, I remember. I remember because it was right here. In REM sleep, REM sleep, this is where you undergo consolidation of memories. So if you want to ensure encoding and that you get that consolidation of those memories, then get some sleep. That will help with that. That's what we're talking about here. All right, when we were talking about the different structures of the limbic system, we talked about two very important structures, the amygdaloid body or the amygdala and the hippocampus. All right, both of these structures help with your long-term memory, all right? specifically the hippocampus here. So where does this long-term memory live? Where does it is, it, is there a specific area in the brain? Yeah, yeah, there is, in association areas. So the appropriate association area will store that long-term memory. Meaning, if you have a visual image of something, that will be stored in your visual association area. If you have an auditory like a song, like the lyrics to a song, and you have that in your long-term memory, right, that will be located in, all right, not, well, not the lyrics of the song, excuse me actual music, and if you can recognize the song, that will be stored in the uh, auditory association area there. So motor memory, okay, or what we call muscle memory, is going to be found in the premotor cortex and the cerebellum. So now you can see the importance of these association areas other than what I was discussing. So there's a movie that came out not too, well, when I say not too long ago, I think it was a while ago, it's called The Long Goodbye, I never saw it. All right. It's a depressing movie. I don't want to watch a depressing movie. I want to watch a cool movie, something fun. All right. This movie is about Alzheimer's disease. And we're seeing now that Alzheimer's disease is becoming or approaching the number one cause for dementia in the developed world. All right. In places like the United States, Canada, uh, Europe, uh, all over. All right. So we're seeing Alzheimer's this is usually a disease that affects older people. And what you'll see is they'll start to have degeneration of their higher order um, areas of, of cognitive function. And it's a progressive condition, so it'll get worse and worse. So it starts off kind of mild in the beginning. You might notice somebody that has Alzheimer's, they might just forget something. They're telling you a story, they can't finish the story, they can't recognize things, places, people. Okay, and over time it gets worse and worse and worse. 
as that goes on, you might notice they might have certain uh, uh, changes in their personality and mood. They might get angry quicker than they used to, right? They might have odd behavioral uh, 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 deficits, right? Start doing things that they have never done before, right? So usually a lot of times when we talk about Alzheimer's, everyone likes to bring up the fact that people start to forget things. They start to have loss of certain memories. Now, <clears throat> As of right now, we still consider the cause of Alzheimer's disease to be idiopathic, right? That means it's unknown, all right? For a while there, some of the leading theories were uh, the beta amyloid plaques that were developing up in the cerebrum in the neurons there were a possible cause and what we call tau protein tangles, right? These irregular shaped proteins, all right, were mixing into the neuron tissue there and causing the damage, right? Again, it's still up in the air. We're not 100% sure. And until we are 100% sure, right, the cause of Alzheimer's is considered to be idiopathic. Unfortunately, there is no cure. There are some medications, right, but they cannot cure uh, folks of Alzheimer's. They can just slow down some of the uh, degeneration and some of the, uh, um, the signs and symptoms. All right, what we have noticed though in folks with uh, Alzheimer's one of the early signs is uh, these folks will uh, have a loss of smell. Oh, oh, okay. Well, when we talk about, yes, this slows down the disease progression, exactly. But what they'll do is they, some of those medications will uh, decrease some of the symptoms. Uh, forgetting and whatnot. But yes, you're absolutely right. <clears throat> yes, exactly. Unfortunately, one of the problems is that kind of leaves us kind of out on a limb there, Rebecca, because we're still not sure 100% what the cause is. And until we don't know what, until we know what the cause is, then um, uh, it's going to really be hard to slow the progression down of any type of disease. All right, amnesia, general amnesia. Sometimes I feel like I have amnesia when I am taking a test and I can't remember certain things. Sometimes when I'm teaching, I feel like I have amnesia when I'm trying to tell you folks something. All right, so amnesia is basically when you can, uh, uh, you have an inability to recall something or you have a complete loss of memory. All right, so there's different causes for this. You can have a psychological trauma. Uh, a perfect example for that is going to be uh, childhood abuse. Uh, we've seen it in, in, in uh, children. I knew a person that had apparently had been uh, sexually abused by one of their parents and had no idea that that had happened. Not until almost a decade after did they find out that that had occurred. Uh, another cause is direct brain injury. You're riding your bike along, you're not wearing a helmet, you fall off your bike, you hit your head, and you forget something. That's what happened to my brother. Um, when we were kids, we had built this 10 speed out of, of parts of other bikes, and he uh, fell off the bike, he flipped over the handlebars and landed on his head. And for a couple of hours, he had no idea what had happened. He had a concussion. And I'll never forget because he kept asking everybody what had happened, how did he get there, and uh, I guess he asked my father one too many times, and my father got very angry at him and started screaming at him, because apparently he'd asked my father that many times, and then he forgot that he asked my father that, and so he kept asking my father, when, I don't know, we laugh about it, I shouldn't be laughing, but he's okay, at least I think he's okay, okay? So how badly this occurs really depends on one, where this occurred in the brain and how badly it happened. Now, obviously, if you damage completely the hippocampus, then unfortunately, you will not be able to form any long-term, any new long-term memories, okay? Because we cannot get that information into those areas, those association areas there. Also, if you damage the thalamus, think about it. What's the thalamus? What is the thalamus's role? is the relay station. All that input information comes up into the thalamus, except for olfaction, except for smell. And it projects, the thalamus will project that information to the appropriate uh, uh, cortex area. 
And so if you damage the thalamus, then you've damaged the relay station and it can't go to the appropriate areas there. Some of our limbic structures like the amygdala, um, and then again, like I said before, the hippocampus there. If you damage those, you can cause issues with uh, uh, the formation of new long-term memories. All right, so emotion, just a quick review. This is the limbic system here. All right, and so of course, all right, emotions are generated by the limbic system and interpreted by the, the limbic system, but how you express those emotions are going to be seen in the prefrontal cortex. All right, the frontal lobe. All right, what do you do when you're when you're happy, okay, or or uh, when you're angry? You might have some facial expressions and body uh, uh, positions, body language. All right, well that is because of the prefrontal cortex, which is going to control how those emotions are expressed. All right, again, right, we're dealing with the amygdala and the hippocampus. They will help with those emotional uh, expressions. Because if you damage those areas, you might see right, somebody's response to something that you and I would consider to be normal. Like if somebody were to get an A on a test, they may be like, yay, and jump around. Um, someone that has damaged the amygdala or the hippocampus, if you tell them, hey, uh, what'd you get on your test? I got an A. You know, and, they just, and they might not do anything. They just might just look like it's just normal every day, whatever. Now, whereas, in a certain situation, you might say, hey, can you uh, pass me a pencil? And the person might turn to you and just start freaking out for whatever reason. All right, so they could have a really exaggerated response to, yeah, here's your pencil, buddy. All right, I'm almost done there. Talking about language, where does language occur? For the most part, we are going to see, all right, language, and you have to understand what it, when we're talking about language, all right, there's a couple uh, components to language. One is the reading of a language, understanding, uh, you know, the meaning of the language, actually being able to speak, and then writing out the words of a language. So when we're talking about language, there's those four components, reading, understanding, speaking, and writing of the words of language. That's what we're talking about. So when we're talking about those two areas, Broca's and Wernicke's. Wernicke's is that area back here, back towards the parietal lobe. That's going to be language comprehension, how well you can interpret language. Me right now, as I'm speaking the language, I am utilizing um, my Broca's area. So, all right, so this is how I am vocalizing and utilizing the speech motor all right, for the language area. And then also, of course, the primary motor cortex right up in here, right? That controls the skeletal muscles that I'm using to make the noise or the sounds, the words that you are hearing. Right? So you can see that there's several different areas that are involved in language. So when we're discussing language and we're talking about Wernicke's area, all right, our language comprehension, we are going to be discussing the categorical hemisphere that comes from cerebral lateralization. So how we're able to analyze the meaning of speech. Whereas when we're talking about the other hemisphere, the representational, that's going to deal with the emotional content of that speech. So if we were to lesion our Wernicke's area on the right side, you will see how folks, because remember, left side is usually going to be the, the, the speech area, okay? That's going to be our categorical hemisphere, is the left side. So if we lesion the right hemisphere, right, we'll see all right, those people having what we call aprodosia. So God forbid, if you have an instructor, an instructor, excuse me, that has aprodosia, maybe some of them do, all right, they are going to talk in a monotone uh, speech. No emotion, very plain, how are you, almost like a robot, okay? You might have a professor like that. I try not to, you know. All right, then we have apraxia of speech and aphasia. Apraxia is the motor disorder. All right, so here's the situation. A person that has apraxia, they have damaged their Broca's area. 
And so this person can think exactly what they want to say. I know exactly what I want to say. So let me say that sentence to you. I know exactly what I want to say. So I can think that. So when I want to convey that to you, I'm going to speak it to you right now. If I have apraxia, it might sound like, you know, does not make any sense. I cannot say it correctly because my broca area is damaged. But yeah, I know what I want to say. That's apraxia. Aphasia, all right, is you can hear the words that I'm saying right now. So you're hearing my language perfectly, all right? But you just have no idea what I am saying. You cannot comprehend what it is. Unfortunately, you might not know that this is going on, right? In some cases, right, we'll see this due to some sort of injury to the brain or some sort of trauma. And then finally, our last clinical view is dyslexia. A right, roommate of mine in college had dyslexia. Right, they had an issue with what we call single word decoding. And as a result of that, their brain has trouble with reading and writing and even the spelling of some words. Now, on a basic level, it'll just be, oh, this person's not a very good speller. They're rearranging letters, right? But they're just having issues with the decoding of these words here. Now, here's the thing. A lot of these folks, okay, at least my roommate, for example, he was a great speaker, very eloquent. And I do believe that part of that was because like with the blind person, they can hear a little bit better. So other traits will improve because of that deficiency. Even though, you know, in college, he always wanted me to proofread his papers. And that put a lot of stress on me because this was before spell check and grammar check were as widespread as they are now, right? But he would ask me to do that for him. And here I am trying, you know, I'm lucky if I'm able to, you know, say a complete sentence and make it and make people understand it. Um, whereas with some of these folks, and, and here's the interesting thing, I'm jumping all over the place here. Um, with some folks, we'll see an improvement with their dyslexia over time because there are methods and techniques that you can use to help improve their ability to read, write, and spell, all right? But my roommate in college, he was always reading books all the time. And I'm saying like novels. So in addition to studying and going to class and whatnot, he was reading novels all of the time. All right, so uh, that's the end of chapter 12.